In this video, I want to talk about the drugs to treat Parkinson's disease. So just as a quick reminder, Parkinson is a neurodegenerative disorder. That means neurons degenerate. So you lose neurons. You lose neurons that are very important for movements. And these are in particular dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra. And therefore, as very important features of Parkinson, you also see all kinds of motor problems. For example, the famous tremor. This is a resting tremor in contrast to essential tremor, where you see this goal-directed tremor at the end of a goal-directed movement. Here it is a resting tremor. Then you have the rigidity, so the resistance, the stiffness throughout a movement. Akinesia, so no movement, bradykinesia, slow movement, so slow or no movement, also problems with initiating a movement, and then also postural high instability, which means you have just problems of imbalance and the tendency to fall. One little mnemonic for this cardinal features goes Parkinson traps you in the body, so we have this TRA traps you in your body. So how can we help someone with Parkinson's disease? So the pharmacology of Parkinson's disease is not very complicated because it's very predictable. So you lose dopaminergic neurons. So what can you do? Well, number one, you could kind of try to increase dopamine. You could prevent the breakdown. You could supplement dopamine. You can give a dopamine precursor, something like that. Then you could just generally mimic dopamine by giving, just stimulating the receptors, giving dopamine agonists. You just stimulate directly the dopamine receptors. And then the last option would be to use anti-muscarinics or anticholinergics. And why is that? Because in the substantia nigra, there's actually a balance between a dopamine and acetylcholine. So usually, there should be a balance. In a patient with Parkinson's disease, you're losing the dopaminergic neurons, and then there's too much acetylcholine around. And you can restore the balance by giving anticholinergics, anti-muscarinics, and restore this balance so that you're having then also less acetylcholine. And that's another option. And this is due to this initial balance that is disturbed in a patient with Parkinson's disease. Let's see if we can fit all the drugs that treat Parkinson's disease in one favorite figure. And what I've pre-drawn here is just the blood-brain barrier, BBB for blood-brain barrier, and here a dopaminergic neuron that releases dopamine. So now, when we are thinking about treating a patient with Parkinson's disease, we may think, well, we're just going to give dopamine. That would be the easiest way. But unfortunately, if you give just dopamine, dopamine cannot pass the blood-brain barrier. But there is a precursor of dopamine, and that's called levodopa, that can pass the blood-brain barrier because there is such a large amino acid pump that lets the levodopa through. So levodopa is this precursor of dopamine, and levodopa also can get into the nerve terminal by this DAT, by this dopamine reuptake transporter, so we're going to get this in. So that's L-dopa. Then this is going to convert it to dopamine. And then we just have dopamine it's going to get into vesicles and then it's going to be released. So we're going to have more dopamine. So one way to treat a patient with Parkinson's disease is to give this drug levodopa. Now, if you would just give levodopa, the patient would just vomit. And that's actually what was done in the beginning. And so that didn't work. Why? Because levodopa is also metabolized to dopamine in the periphery, not just in the central nervous system, also in the periphery. And once you have a lot of dopamine in the periphery, 
Well, what's going to happen? Number one, you're going to get nausea and vomiting. Why? Because there are dopamine receptors in the chemoreceptor trigger zone. The chemoreceptor trigger zone is not very well protected from the blood-brain barrier. So it's still considered a peripheral effect. So if you just give levodopa, it's going to be converted to dopamine, and you're going to just start vomiting. Then there's a couple of other things that dopamine can do in the periphery. You can get all sorts of arrhythmias. I'm just going to draw here a heart to remind you about that. So arrhythmias. And then dopamine is also vasodilatory. So actually, let's draw in here a little blood vessel. You're going to get or so static hypotension. And that are all so-called peripheral adverse effect of dopamine. So again, if you just give levodopa, that's going to happen, and we're not going to get a lot into the brain, and therefore we're going to mainly see adverse effect, and, not, and our Parkinson is not going to get better. But fortunately, what we can do is there's an enzyme that's called this aromatic decarboxylase. Let's just draw, um, name it DC for decarboxylase. And this decarboxylase is responsible for converting levodopa to dopamine. So what about if we use a drug that blocks this decarboxylase? And this drug is called carbidopa. Carbidopa. So carbidopa is a peripheral decarboxylase inhibitor. So only the peripheral. This decarboxylase also is present here in the central nervous system, but this drug doesn't pass a blood-brain barrier, so it's going to stay here. And what's going to happen is you have more levodopa, and then the levodopa can do its job. And this is the most famous drug for the use of Parkinson's disease. This is in the category of one we said, just increase dopamine. This was our first category of drug, increase dopamine. So in this category, we have levodopa, carbidopa. And the brand name is Cinemet. And I want to point that out because it's, a, it's an interesting brand name because it tells you a lot also about the pharmacology. It's Cinemet, which is Latin for cineemesis. So cine means without, and emesis is nausea vomiting, so vomiting. So without vomiting, because when you give levodopa alone, it's just going to vomit. So you give levodopa carbidopa, and you're not going to vomit. So without vomiting, cinemet. That's our mainstay therapy in Parkinson's disease. Now, what else can we do to increase dopamine, synaptic availability of dopamine? We can use what is called a COMT inhibitor. This stands for catechol o methyl transferase. So this is an enzyme that actually also breaks down levodopa. So levodopa is also broken down by the COMT COMT into some inactive forms, inactive metabolites. And the idea would be, well, if I use a COMT inhibitor, then you're just going to have more levodopa, more levodopa gets into the brain, and then it's going to be converted to dopamine, and we're going to increase dopamine. And these are COMT inhibitors, as I already said. Um, they all have a common ending, which is always very helpful. They are called the capones, because they all end in capone. And the one that I would remember is entacapone, so I'm going to put it here, N Ta capone. So these are the capones. Compt inhibitor, the capones. There is actually also central compt, which is going to decrease dopamine. So it's also found there, but not all the capones are going to get into the central nervous system. So I'm just going to leave it by that. But I want to put in here another enzyme that degrades dopamine, and that's called 
MaOB, monoamine oxidase B, which is all going to make us some inactive metabolites. So another way to increase dopamine is to use an MaOB inhibitor. And the famous one here is selegiline. MAO stands for monoamine oxidase, and the B form, um, this isoform, is particularly important for breakdown of dopamine. So not just all monoamines, the B is more for dopamine, not so much for norepinephrine and serotonin. And that's selegiline, so that should be also here on the list of how can I get more dopamine around. I'm just going to prevent the breakdown. And here on my list are the MAOB inhibitors. And selegiline is the one that I would remember. So what are our other options besides just increasing the availability of dopamine? And I've just written these drugs now um, in small letters so that we have a little bit more space. So again, levodopa, carbidopa, COMT inhibitors, MAO, B inhibitors. And I hope it also should make sense that COMT inhibitors, particularly if you're dealing with the ones that inhibit the peripheral COMT, make most sense to give with levodopa carbidopa, because only if you give levodopa, you can prevent the breakdown of levodopa. And MAOB inhibitors could be potentially given alone, but usually they're also just added to levodopa carbidopa. Okay, so our second option is to mimic dopamine to give dopamine agonists. And that's a fairly straightforward way because what we're gonna do is just um, not worry about what's happening here. We are just gonna say, well, here we have this postsynaptic dopamine receptors. And what we can do is just directly stimulate them. If there's not enough dopamine, we just use a dopamine agonist and stimulate our dopamine receptors. And a famous dopamine agonist that I would remember is ropinerol. Ropinerol, probably Pexor. But let's stick with ropinerol. Okay, so that's fairly straightforward. Um, we are losing our dopaminergic neurons. There's less dopamine around. We're just going to stimulate directly the dopamine receptors. What else are our options? Well, we said the last option or another option is anti-muscarinics. And again, that doesn't fit so well into this picture here. Here we have just to say more generally, there should be a balance. I'm just going to draw the seesaw, and there should be a balance between dopamine and acetylcholine. This is destroyed in Parkinson because you lose dopaminergic neurons, you have too much acetylcholine. What can you do? Well, you can block acetylcholine to, to restore this balance with anti muscarinics and a famous anti-muscarinic that you can use in Parkinson is trihexyphenidol. There's just one other drug that doesn't really fit into there. It's kind of a drug, an old drug with various mechanisms of action. This drug's name is amantidine. was originally an influenza drug. It does a lot of things. People think that it's going to lead to more dopamine release. It may also stimulate dopamine receptors, may lead to less dopamine reuptake. So a lot of different things, not really clear. So unknown, I write unknown mechanism of action. I mean, there's m a lot of different uh, mechanism of action known, but it's not really clear what is the most important. And it's also rarely used, but I think it's important to put it at least into the category of Parkinson disease drugs. So just to summarize again, either we increase dopamine, we make sure we have more dopamine around, we give a dopamine precursor, we inhibit the breakdown of this precursor, we give an MAOB inhibitor that prevents the breakdown of dopamine by itself, 
or we don't care what dopamine does, we just stimulate directly the receptors with dopamine um, agonists, we could also try to restore this balance of dopamine and acetylcholine with antimuscarinics, or we use a drug called amantidine, with, which has several miscellaneous actions.